Hey, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. Um, you're going to need a Bible. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. If you've got a Bible on your smartphone, on your tablet, you can use that. Uh, we've got ushers coming up and down the aisles with Bibles. You'll find Colossians 1 in our Bible on page 983. It's going to be towards the back of the book. 983, you'll find Colossians 1. My name's Chad Blackman. I'm the pastor of student ministry here at Shelter Cove. If this is your first time, man, I want to say welcome. I want to say welcome to our family. Great to have you here. We are stoked to have you here. This is a special weekend in the life of our church. Um, as you saw when you walked in through the doors, we got a big Mexico auction going on out there. Let me explain why we do that. We only charge our students and leaders about half the cost it takes to get down there. We only charge half because we want as many to go as possible. We want as many to go on this trip as possible, but we've got to make up that cost somewhere, and, and we do it through this auction. Now, historically, this church has been off the charts faithful in helping support us. You've been so good to Youth Missions, so thank you. I appreciate it. Ask that you would continue to support it. I ask that you would continue to support this trip. Uh, we've tried to get some great auction items. Go out there, check that stuff out. Larry Max hooking up some delicious tri-tip. Uh, we've got a lot of good stuff out there, so check that out. Big thanks, big, big thanks to Amanda Adams and Donna Michaelis. Uh, the reason why that thing's gonna run really, really well is because I had little to do with it. I just said, <laughs> I can't do this. Do it for me, please. And they were very gracious to do it. So a uh, big thank you to them. Now, Colossians chapter 1 is kind of the, the spiritual preparation. It's kind of the, it's, the, it's the rails that we've been running on as we spiritually prepare for this trip. Our theme this year is blameless. You're going to see where that comes up in our text in just a little bit. But I want to explain to you what's going on in the book of Colossians. I want to explain why this book is written. Paul writes this book in response to something. He's writing in response to something. And that something is called, you ready? Look at me. Syncretism. Syncretism. Chad, I don't know what syncretism is. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you, okay? I'll tell you what it means. Here's what syncretism is. Syncretism is taking a little bit from this religion, a little bit from this religion, a little bit from this philosophy, a little bit from this idea, and you mash it together into this weird, hybrid, pseudo-spiritual religion, okay? The queen of this is Oprah Winfrey, all right? She, she takes uh, Christianity with Eastern mysticism, with human secularism, with, um, with universalism, and she just kind of fuses it into Oprahology is what I call it. Um, and she's very, very good at it, okay? That's what syncretism is. And Paul writes this letter in response to it. Here's how Christians are to respond to this kind of buffet-style religion, where we take a little bit here, a little bit here, and we just put it all on our plate. Now, the book of Colossians is so important for us today, because in the United States, we live, and I would argue this strongly, in probably the most diverse culturally, religiously, ethnically, I mean very diverse culture. So there's all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of ideas, religions around us, right? Just my neighborhood alone. The man that lives on the direct left of me is from Portugal and is an atheist. The guy that lives on the direct right of me is from Sinaloa, Mexico, and is a Pentecostal Christian. Two doors down is an African-American who uh, is kind of working through Christianity. He's thinking through some things. He's got some questions. And, and so him and I are talking. And that's just my neighborhood alone. I bet that your neighborhoods, your workplaces, the schools that you go to are very diverse. Lots of ideas, lots of different things swirling around us. It's a great thing about our culture, honestly. Love that it's a very diverse culture. But as Christians, how do we navigate that wisely? There are going to be some questions that we need to answer very, very clearly if we're going to handle this wisely. Paul's going to help frame that up for us. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23? Here's how my translation begins. He, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. 
and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, and you, and you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray. God, I, I thank you for these people. Thank you for uh, the time that we get to have together and pray, Holy Spirit, that you would teach them, God. I pray that you would speak deep into their hearts. I say this frequently, Lord, I can do little more than just cheerlead and encourage so I'm praying that, that you would use my feeble, silly little preaching to, to speak deep truth into people's hearts, that you might be glorified, that you might get the recognition and praise you're deserving of. That's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. In the first century, the Jews had a saying. The Jews had a saying that no good Jew goes to Caesarea Philippi. If you're a faithful Jew, you do not set foot in the city of Caesarea Philippi. Here's why. Caesarea Philippi was riddled with idolatry, riddled with paganism and idolatry. I'll explain just two briefly. In Caesarea Philippi, two gods were worshiped. The first one, Baal. Baal was worshiped by killing men, women, and children and at Caesarea Philippi, there's a large hole in the ground that falls a couple hundred feet to an underground river. You can visit this place to this day. The hole has been closed up because of an earthquake, but you can see the remnants of where this used to be. They used to kill men, women, and children and throw their bodies down this hole because it was believed this is where Baal entered and exited the underworld. So to keep him happy, you provide human sacrifices. The other god that's worshipped at Caesarea Philippi is a god named Pan. Pan is half goat, half man. You worshipped Pan through temple prostitution, and I don't know a gentle way to say this, but through acts of bestiality with goats. That's how they would worship. For the Jews, this was unbelievably vile, unbelievably dirty. No good Jew goes here. So Matthew chapter 16, Jesus rounds up his 12 Jewish disciples, and where does he go? Caesarea Philippi, gotta love Jesus. He marches right into that place. And with this backdrop of idolatry, with this backdrop of wickedness, he asks his disciples a very pointed question. Who do people say that I am? And they're like, well, some people say you're a prophet. Some people say you're Elijah that's come back from the dead, or, or you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Jesus says, okay. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And I'm going to turn that question on you today as well. This question dictates the trajectory of the rest of your life. How you answer this question dictates the trajectory of where you're gonna go for the rest of your life, especially within our very diverse, pluralistic culture. Who you say Jesus is, is unbelievably important. In your notes, your first point, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Now, Paul here, very Jewish. Paul here, very Jewish in his description. He's gonna use seven things. Seven things to describe Jesus. We're gonna do six up front. The seventh one, I'm gonna come back at the very end, and I'll, I'll talk about it at the very end, all right? Six things. Verse 15 begins like this. He, speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. What does this mean? The Bible's going to teach that we cannot look at the Father and live. God explicitly says that in the Old Testament explicitly says to Moses, you can't look at me and live. My holiness is so overbearing, it will stop your heart. Can't look at me. 
It's for your own safety. I will not have you look at me. Paul says in Timothy, God the Father dwells in unapproachable light and nobody has seen him. Now that's really bad news for us. How do we know what God's like if we can't even look at him? How do we know what it's like if we can't even approach him? We have really good news. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the link. What this text just said is that he's the icon. That's the Greek word. He's the icon of the invisible God. If we want to know what the Father's like, we look to Jesus. If we want to know what the Spirit's like, we look to Jesus. What does the Father enjoy? We look to Jesus. What does the Father dislike? We look to Jesus. There are all kinds of wacky ideas that, that circulate our culture that you have to go through a priest, you have to go through some kind of meditation, or you have to take some kind of substance, usually in the form of marijuana, mushrooms, or acid, <laughs> to touch base and connect with God. Eh. Jesus is the link. Nothing's gonna get you closer to God than Jesus. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus himself says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. He's the direct image, the direct representation of God. Number two, it goes on here to say that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn of all creation. I love Saturday mornings. I love Saturday mornings because one of two people are gonna come to my doorstep on a Saturday morning. I don't know why they keep coming. God bless them, they keep coming. One of two people, they're gonna look like this. Usually two young men dressed in a clean button-down white shirt, black slacks, little name tag, and usually a bike helmet. And they're going to say, hey, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. We're Christians. Okay. Or it's going to be some sweet old ladies, man. They're just so friendly and warm, so gentle. And they're going to say, hey, we'd love to tell you about Jehovah's plan. We'd love to tell you about Jehovah's plan for the future. Do you know what that is? I say, I do know what that is. Do you know what that is? <laughs> And I'm going to ask him a question. Who's Jesus? Oh, he's the son of God. What does that mean? Who's Jesus? He's the son of God. What does that mean? Well, he's the first created creature. Eh, wrong. But here's where they get it. They get it from this passage right here. Because they look at it and they go, firstborn. Well, that means he's the firstborn, right? It's in black and white. What does this word firstborn really mean? But what, is this, what does this idea mean? I'm going to throw a verse here up on the screens, and I want you to track with me on this, okay? This comes right out of the Psalms. If we could throw this text up on there, that would be great. This is talking about David. Now, now track with me. I want you to see if it ever switches from speaking about David, okay? I found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I've anointed him. Still talking about David, yeah? So that my hand will be established with him. Still David? Uh, yeah. My arm also strengthen him. Yeah. Still David. The enemy shall not outwit him. Still David? Yes. I will crush his foes before him. Still David. Let's go to the next slide. My faithfulness, my steadfast love shall, not, shall be with him. Still David? Yeah. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. Still David. I'll set his hands on the sea. Still David. He shall cry to me, you're my father. Still David. Now watch this. I will make him the firstborn. Pop quiz. Was David the firstborn son? He was not. In fact, he's the youngest. And not only is he the youngest, but he's a shepherd. That's insult to injury. He's the youngest and he's exiled to the fields with sheep. And God says, that's the firstborn. This concept of firstborn in the Bible refers to somebody that is highly favored, somebody that inherits the promises of God. And that's what it's speaking about Jesus in Colossians. Jesus was not born. He is the highly favored one of God, the one that inherits the promises of God. Monumental difference in theology. Those very sweet people that come to your door are going to take you with a smile on their face into some very Wicked theology. Jesus was not created. He was not created. He's the highly favored one who inherits the promises of God. Verse 16 says this. Ooh, this is good. You'll like this. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible 
and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Here's another reason why I know Jesus is not created, because that verse just said he's the creator of everything. He's the creator of everything. I used to read Genesis chapter one where it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and I used to think that was the father. I used to think the father did that but this text tells us differently. Well, the father definitely had the idea of creating but who's the active agent? Jesus. Jesus created everything. Here's why this blows my mind. Let's just talk about our son. Just our son, the star that we revolve around. You ready? If you could drill a hole into our sun, it would be able to fit 1.3 million Earths. Our sun, every single second, is fusing together 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium. That's about 2,700 fully loaded 747s every single second. The sun's core, the sun's core produces the equivalent of a hundred billion, I said that with a B, a hundred billion atomic bombs. The equivalent amount of energy is a hundred billion atomic bombs every single second. Jesus did not labor and toil and struggle to create this star. Do you know what he did? He spoke. He spoke. And that amount of energy, that amount of power, boom, came into existence. And that's just our star. There's about 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Let there be light. And let there be light to separate the night from the day. Boom, and it's created. That's off the charts power. That is off the charts authority. That is off the charts strength. That is unlike any other God. That is unlike any other thing that we are ever going to come in contact with. Let there be, boom, at the command of his word. And then it says that rulers, authorities, dominions, powers, all that stuff he created. So here's what this means. Every king, every president, every queen, every, pol every politician and political ruler has been put in place by God, by Jesus specifically. So no matter how the election goes this year, breathe. <laughs> breathe. Jesus is in control. It's, it's Jesus filtered, whoever gets put into office. But this also refers to angels, demons, and Satan. Jesus created them. Jesus is in control of them. There is this weird duality that sometimes gets painted that evil and good are in a cosmic struggle, that it's a neck and neck race and we're not really sure which one's gonna win. The Bible doesn't describe that. The Bible describes that Jesus is in control of demons and Satan. He allows them to do what they are able to do. There's nothing they do he's not aware of and he's not allowing. My mom used to say this to me and my little brother when we were being punks. She would get down right in our face and she'd go, I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. <laughs> she used to say that. Why? Because she had authority over us. She had authority over us. Jesus has the same thing. I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. <clears throat> you do nothing. You do nothing outside of what I allow and what I will, and there's coming a time where I'm going to end you. There's no cosmic struggle between good and evil. Jesus is going to win. He's in control. He's in control. And then, and then the text says that he holds everything together. So it's not enough that he created it. It's not enough that he places all these authorities and powers into place, but he's sustaining, actively sustaining the earth's orbit around the sun, actively telling the waves, you come no farther than this. You will not drown the land. Actively keeping stars in their orbit, actively keeping galaxies placed together. And Hebrews says he does it 
by the word of his power. He doesn't toil. He doesn't slave over it. It's not back-breaking labor. He says, do it. And it stays there. He's the creator. He's the creator. Text goes on to say, he's the head of the body. Verse 18, he's the head of the body, the church. Now, historically, the church has made some foolish decisions. Historically, the church has done some things that we should not be proud of. Here's why I'm going to continue to side with a Bible-teaching, gospel-preaching church. Because Jesus is leading it. There may be under-shepherds. There may be men put in charge to teach and lead. But ultimately, Christ is calling the shots. As a staff here, we have resolved as best as we can to follow Christ. We want him to lead us. You don't want this church being led by me or being led by Jeremy. We're kind of dumb. Jesus, on the other hand, that dude's pretty smart. He can lead us. So sometimes there's this weird thing where we go, man, I, I like Jesus, he's cool, but, but the church, I don't like the church. I get, I get why people say that, I do. But you see, Jesus and the church, they're spaghetti and meatballs, man. Jesus, his idea was the church, and he leads the church. That's why we're called to be a part of it. That's why we're called to be a part of it. Goes on to say, he's the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the first born from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. Chad, how can you be born from the dead? That makes no sense at all. I'm glad you asked that question. Let me tell you. What this means is that Jesus is the first person to resurrect unto eternal life. Other people had come back from the dead. He called his buddy Lazarus out of the tomb and Lazarus came back out from the dead. But Lazarus died again. Jesus is the only one to come back to life and never die again. And he serves as a living, breathing example of what's waiting for you and I. For those that believe, we may die physically, but we're never, ever going to die spiritually. Eternal life awaits us, and Christ is the forerunner of that. Christ is the example of that. But the text said something else. It says that he's the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything, in everything, how much is everything? It's everything, very good. In everything, he might be preeminent. He might be top of the food chain. Nothing higher, nothing beyond him. Preeminent. Why? Because nobody else in the history of history has ever resurrected themselves from the grave. You say, Chad, that is, that's a fairy tale. How... What kind of lie? How do you claim to be a logical thinker when you're going to tell me that a man came back from the dead? You see, this is my problem with Christianity. I can't believe far fetched claims like that. That would be a persuasive argument if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus showed himself to 500 people. 500 people. It wasn't just like some hillbilly in Denaire, it was 500 people <laughs> in urban centers, in cities. He showed up and went, Here I am. I told you, one of Jesus' own disciples, Thomas, said, there's no way I'll ever believe. I'm not going to believe until I put my fingers in the nail holes. I won't believe. So Jesus shows up eight days later and goes, what's up, bro? Believe now. I don't think he said that, but it was pretty close. It was pretty close to that. <laughs> what happens next Man, what happens next is unbelievable. Thomas touches him. And he falls at the feet of Christ. And he says, O kuriasmu, o theasmu, my Lord and my God. Nobody has ever resurrected from the dead and shown themselves to people. You could touch me, you could see it. When the gospels are written, people are still alive that could vouch for what happened. The Gospels are not written once upon a time in a land far away. It's men saying, we saw it. We're not wishfully thinking here. We were eyewitnesses. We watched this guy walk on water. We watched him give sight to the blind. We saw him with the nail holes, man. We touched him. We're eyewitnesses. Very different than, well, we just believe. No, we saw it so that in everything he would be preeminent. 
so that we'd worship him above everything else. This last one here, and I'm gonna move on. 19 says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is really what Paul's trying to say. Ready? How much is all? Very good. How much is the fullness? Is it 50%? No, because that would be the halfness. Fullness is 100%, am I right? This passage is redundant. All the fullness, 100% of the 100% of God was in Jesus. What's Paul saying? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He's not a teacher. He's not a prophet. He's not some enlightened man like Buddha or like Confucius. He is God. Now, C.S. Lewis summarized this brilliantly. You have no neutral ground when it comes to Jesus. You don't have neutral ground. He's very polarizing. Jesus is either God in the flesh like he claimed, or he is the most sociopathic, maniacal, egotistical liar to have ever walked the face of the earth. He's either Lord or he's a lunatic. If somebody came in here right now and said, I'm God, I mean, what would you think? Like, dude's bananas. The guy's crazy. Jesus, for three years, I'm God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Before Abraham was, ego a me, I am. The Jews knew exactly what he was saying. I'm God. Who is Jesus? How you answer this question directs the trajectory of the rest of your life. If Jesus is a teacher, if Jesus is just a good man, if Jesus is just a philosopher, we're in trouble. The scriptures are unbelievably clear. He's God. God in human form. He's God. Now that was six items. The seventh one, I'm gonna come back. Verse 21, the gears change. Verse 21, the gears change. And the focus shifts from Jesus to us, shifts to us. I wanna ask you a question. Who are we? In your notes, who are we? Modern education, modern universities, modern academia are going to tell you today that we are essentially good. We are essentially good people. It's politics, it's disparity in the work, in the workplace, it's corruption. Those are the things that make humans bad. I always giggle when I hear that because I'm like, okay, the one common denominator and all those things, people make up education, people make up politics, people make up uh, workplaces. It's people. Maybe people are the actual problem. Scriptures are gonna be very clear here. Let's look at this. 21, and you, that means you, just so we're clear. And you, who once were alienated. Okay, we gotta stop there. Alienated means that we're cut off, separated, completely estranged, foreign to who God is in the dark. We are completely separated, foreigners to the ways of God, alienated. It goes on to say, and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. The book of Titus will explain that our sinful natures have done something to us. We are intrinsically, we're fundamentally, it is our default setting to be Hostile towards God, hostile towards people, and people are hostile towards us. We hate God, we hate others, others hate us because we hate them, but we hate them because they hate us. So we're haters all the way around. This is our sinful state. Let me explain to you how this plays out in real life. Rachel was going to Costco on Friday. She pulled into the parking lot. The parking lot was uh, unusually busy that day. She's waiting in line, um, and there's a guy that starts backing out. She's like, sweet, I'm, I'm gonna take this parking spot. She's waiting there, the guy's slowly backing out, making sure he doesn't hit anyone. He backs out and, and starts to drive off, and she begins to go into the parking spot. Some lady turns the corner, hammers on the gas, and goes right into that parking spot, cutting her off, and proceeds to stick her head out the window, yells all kinds of cursing words at, at Rachel, and shows her her biggest finger. Now, the irony is Rachel found a, a spot three, row, three spaces up further. Yes, gotcha. Um, but, <laughs> but there's a man there. There's an older man there who watched this whole thing go down. And that older man says to this lady, hey, Rachel was waiting. She was waiting for that spot. 
And she sticks her head out the window, tells him to go, I can't say it in church, do something to himself, and, and tells Rachel can do something to herself too. Let me ask you a question. What possesses a human to curse, belittle, and attack two other fellow humans over painted lines on some asphalt? <laughs> I'm serious. Some of you are laughing because that you've experienced this. Some of you aren't laughing because you are the people that cut others off. <laughs> Look at me, we're hostile. In our natural selves, we're hostile. We hate God, we hate others, they hate us. We're hostile. This means we are enemies of God. We're not children, we're not beloved, we're enemies, we're objects of wrath. Isn't that encouraging? Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> Next question. What did Jesus do? What did he do? Uh, a lot of Christians wear bracelets. What would Jesus do? I'm going to tell you what he did do. I'm going to tell you what he did do. Pick it up with me in verse 22. 22 says this. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. Come with me back to verse 20. 20 says this. And through him to, what's that next word? Reconcile. You see, we covered six aspects about Jesus. Here's the seventh one. Jesus is our reconciler. What did Jesus do? This text says that he reconciled us. Past tense. He reconciled us. Now, what does that word reconcile mean? In the Bible, Jesus is described in all kinds of ways. He is Messiah. He's Savior. He's Redeemer. He has set us free from sin. All those descriptions are used of Jesus. Very specifically, Paul uses the word reconciler. When we use the word reconciled, it oftentimes refers to a husband and a wife when they're fighting. Husband did something dumb, wife did something dumb, they're at each other's throats, they're fighting. And there usually is a third party that comes in, maybe a pastor or a friend or a counselor who tries to reconcile them, who tries to bring them back to peace, right? This text says, our reconciler before a holy God is not a friend, is not a pastor, is not a priest, He's not a lawyer. He's not a counselor. Our reconciler is the creator, sovereign, most high, almighty God of everything. He has reconciled us, and it explains how. Verse 20 says, by the blood. Verse 22 says, in his body of flesh. What does this mean? Look at me. You've got to hear this. If you hear nothing else, you've got to hear this. Christ came down in human form, lives a perfect life, and it's like he made a deal with the Father. It's like he cut a deal with the Father and said, here's what I'll do. These humans have been sinning, they're dummies, but I created them, and I love them, and I love them. And I, I can't see them perish under the justice and the wrath and the condemnation you have against their sin. So do this. Take it out on me. Take it out on me. Pour out all of your wrath. Pour out all of your justice on me instead of them. I will go to the cross and I will take it for them. So when Christ's back is lacerated by the whips, when his head has that crown of thorns mashed into his skull, when his wrists and ankles are staked to those crossbars, every drop of blood, every agonizing breath, it was the Father pouring out his wrath on Christ instead of us. He emptied it all out on Jesus. This is wonderful news. Do you know why? Because that means there's no more wrath against us. It's gone. Romans 8 is going to say, for those that are in Christ, there is no more condemnation. It's gone. Every single sin we've ever done, are doing now, and are going to do 
when we trust Jesus, it's all been taken care of. God's anger, God's wrath towards it all poured out on Jesus. The scriptures are going to say that our iniquities, our sin was placed on him and by his wounds we are healed. And so now the change happens. Now the flip happens. You see, Paul said we once were alienated. We once were hostile. We once were evil. But now, because Christ has taken our punishment, the Father sees you and I as holy, blameless, and above reproach. You and I have been given if we trust Jesus, a foreign righteousness. We've been given a righteousness that is not our own, it's Jesus. He has transferred to us his righteousness and taken from us our sin and condemnation. We have perfect standing before the Father, not because we are perfect, but because Jesus took our sin and gave to us his righteousness. Say, Chad, that that sounds good for you, I mean, but you don't, you don't know what I've done. And Chad, that, that works for, for you cute little Christians, but like I'm a major league sinner. Like I got, I got dark stuff in my past. Dark stuff I'm going through right now. I just don't think God can forgive someone like me. And the only thing I would say to that is just please read the book of Acts. Specifically seven and eight, chapter seven and eight. Because what you're going to read, you're going to read about the guy that wrote our text here today. His name was once Saul, and it gets changed to Paul. Saul, in Acts chapter 7, is watching the murder, the murder of an innocent Christian man. And do you know what he's doing? He's applauding heartily. In fact, he says, give me your coats. Let me hold your jackets. Because the way that they're murdering this innocent man is taking rocks the size of softballs and pelting this man. Paul is watching Stephen. His ribs get crushed. His face get crushed. Blood squirting out of his body. Dying an agonizing death. And yes, well done. In fact, give me your jacket so you can throw those rocks harder. And then the next chapter He meets Jesus, and he gets saved. And then he writes 75% of the New Testament, becomes one of the most ferocious men of God to have ever walked the face of the earth. The M.O. of Jesus is to save and redeem people that should not be saved and redeemed. That's his whole M.O. So I I would just plead with you. I don't care how big you think your sin is it pales in comparison to what Christ has accomplished on the cross. God has treated Jesus as if Jesus committed all our sins. He crushed them. We are now treated when we trust Jesus as if we have the righteousness of God. We're holy, blameless, and above reproach. I love that word, above reproach. That means above condemnation. That means above accusation. When Satan comes and goes, ah, Chad screwed up again. Chad messed up again. You need to punish him. God goes, yeah, he messed up. I already took it out on Jesus, though. You have no accusation here. Ah, Chad, ah, man, he did it again. I I know. I took it out on Jesus. The penalty's been paid. You have no charge here. You have no accusation you can leverage here. (laughs) That's mind-blowing. That's awesome news. So that means it doesn't matter how you came in here today. It means Jesus can take those who are hostile, alienated, wicked, reconcile them to a perfect, beautiful, holy God. The question is now, what do we do? In your notes, what do we do? Paul's very clear here. Very clear. 23. He says that we're holy, we're blameless, we're above reproach before him. 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. I mean, that's the answer. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. But I know, I know that's super churchy. I know that's like really churchy. What does that look like in real life? The temptation. The temptation that you and I are gonna face 
is to see the majesty, to see the glory of Christ and behold it and love it, but then we're gonna leave here and life is gonna come at us. And that, that buzz that we're on, that high, that Jesus high that we're on is gonna start to wane. And so we go, yeah, Jesus was great at one point, but, but it just seems like he's not really cutting it anymore. So maybe I need Jesus plus something else. Maybe I need Jesus and, oh, if I just had that promotion at work, man, that would really make me complete. If I just had that spouse, man, if I just could get married, if I could just hook up with that hot girl at work, man, then I'd be complete. Man, if the Raiders would just win the Super Bowl, I'd be complete. They're not going to, okay? So they're not, they're not going to. Our tendency is going to be to take Jesus and go, yeah, he's, Jesus is good, but oh, if I just had this as well. If I just had this as well. And that takes all kinds of forms. That's exactly what the Colossians were doing. They were taking a part of this, a part of this, tacking it on to Jesus. The whole point of what I've been trying to say is that Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient in and of himself. The danger is that we can turn Jesus into the stepping stone for what we really want. So if it is that promotion at work, well, Jesus, I'll pray and I'll go to church as long as you hook me up with that job. Oh, so the promotion's what you really worship, not Jesus. What happens if you don't get that promotion? Is Jesus still enough? Is your love and your hope and your security still rooted in that he died for you? Or, or is it in stuff? Uh, maybe it's in the addiction that you just can't seem to shake the end of that roach, the end of the bottle, whatever that addiction, you just can't seem to push off. Our temptation is gonna be to go Jesus and something else. Jesus is enough. We need nothing more. All the fullness of God is in him. He's everything we need. There's one final point. One final point, and it goes like this. You're gonna have to fill it in. It's gonna have to be from yourself. It, I wrote it out like this. I will, I will hope in Jesus, not blank. And that blank's gonna look different for all of us in here. But I don't know what that blank is for you. What do you find that your hope and your security continues to get drawn towards? That stuff can be pulled away really quick. Jesus, not so much. May we be a people that hope in Jesus. Jesus.